having a great day. Welcome to our online service here at the Church at the Beach. Today we're taking step two of our on the road process and the main emphasis is going to be on getting people in the local church to serve God by serving others. You know we're not called just to sit around. No, we're called to good works and the Bible even takes that one step further and the Bible teaches us that when we were in our mother's womb God was forming each one of us to serve him by doing good works and serving other people. So I hope you enjoy today's sermon. And we're about to go in uh, to a little bit more worship and song. And this song reminds me so much of my sister, Christy Pickrell. You know, I remember her so well as a young lady up on this stage, singing her heart out to Jesus because her Redeemer, just like my Redeemer, and I hope your Redeemer, lives. So God bless you and I'll see you on the back side. Who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? And who told the oceans you can only come this far? as Christians. We've done that in the United States of America. I said a prayer. I've been saved. 
And now I'm good to go out there and act like a hellion the rest of my life. And then, but when I die, everything will be okay because when I was seven years old or when I was 15 at youth camp or when my pretty girlfriend walked to the front and she was saved, I walked up there too because I wanted her to still hold hands with me on the way home from church that night. And I said a prayer and I get to go to heaven instead of go to hell when I die because of that. Folks, that's not the way it works. But we have this whole generation of people in the United States of America. Are you active in church? No. Do you serve God by serving other people? No. Well, then what in the world makes you think that you are a follower of Christ and that you are, are good and been and reconciled with God the way that a human being is supposed to be? Well, when I was, when I was seven, I, I, I think that my, my grandmother told me, told me that, I, that I said a prayer. Folks, I have to tell you, it's stepping on some people's toes. I can tell by the way I'm saying it. You are absolutely, positively lofter than a goose. If you think at some point in your life, you asked Jesus into your heart, and then there was absolutely no change about you whatsoever, and years and years have passed by, and you absolutely have never turned and lived for God. There would be a day, and I hope one day soon there will be a day here, where some devout men, and possibly women too, would say amen to such a notion. That we desire for people to be led to holiness. Not perfection, but that we are leading people to holiness and purity and being unpolluted. If we wanted to use a church term, we would call it sanctification. If we were going to use a church term about that instantaneous bam, we would say justification. And justification cannot take place without your heart being changed and you being, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, born again. How can a person go back into his mother's womb and be born again? You don't understand. Jesus said. God has to regenerate and turn your heart alive. And when you do that, when the Holy Spirit does that, then your response is, I am turning to your ways. You are the Son of God, and what you say is best for me is best for me. And then the Holy Spirit, boom, and dwells inside of you. And then every single day, the Holy Spirit is helping you grow more and more and more like Jesus. Do you sometimes take a step back? Absolutely. But the Holy Spirit convicts you, and you get back on the road, and you go right back to chasing glory. If that's not your experience... If you are here today, you are so fortunate. If you are here today and your salvation is based on a prayer you said at some point in your life, and that is the entirety of it and all that you have to go on, you are so fortunate to be here today because what I have to share with you is if you are a Christian, you will grow to the point that you serve God by serving people. So here we are today. I want to just cover some religious elites were trying to trick Jesus, Matthew chapter 22. What are the two most important commandments? Because here's what they were going to do, kiddos. They were going to take what Jesus said and say that he was teaching falsely, and then they were going to be able to kill him. Now, Jesus knew that they were going to figure out a way to kill him anyway, but he told the truth, and after this, the religious leaders were astonished, and they just backed off, and they said, we're not dealing with this guy anymore. We've got to find another way. But what... What's the greatest or most important law or commandment? And Jesus replied and said, I think it's from Deuteronomy. He said, you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And Jesus, always being the overachiever, right, and said, oh, and the second one is like it. Well, I'm sure. Oh, well. Okay, we didn't catch him. He was quoting Deuteronomy. But then I think he goes back and he quotes numbers, or maybe it's Leviticus, and he says, you're to love your neighbor as yourself. We've got a lot of Christians that absolutely are all about their Jesus, but they're not absolutely all about their Jesus' other followers. We've got to grow and get better at that. This church is on the road to be better at that. Some of you have heard uh, that, that your righteous deeds or your works are like filthy rags. I want to read to you Isaiah 64. Just a couple verses, 5 and 6. 
This is the prophet Isaiah talking to, to God here. So, you welcome the one who joyfully does what is right. They remember you in your ways. But we, Isaiah speaking for all of Israel, but we have sinned and you are angry. Man, we don't ever talk about God being angry, and I don't mean to either, but it says here that he, he does. gets angry. And you are angry. How can we be saved if we remain in our sins? All of us have become like something unclean, and all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. We've used that as a justification in the churches not to know that we're supposed to get off our rear end and go to work. Because our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. No, that is for lost people. That our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And I'm not going to tell you aloud this morning what, you're, what that really means when it talks about filthy rags or polluted garment. It's disgusting beyond what I'm willing to say from the podium. But I will tell you one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or three after the service, if you want to know what Isaiah actually said when he was speaking Hebrew. So that is only for the unsaved, but for the saved. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10. Read along with me. It's okay if you even read aloud. All right? It'll be up on the screen, I think. And you were dead in your trespasses. This is Paul talking to a bunch of Christians. Specific, specifically in the city of Ephesus, but really it would have gone around to several churches in what was known in the ancient world as Asia Minor. I'd, I should say Roman world as Asia Minor. That's not ancient. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, that is Satan, the spirit now working in the disobedient, Folks, right there, that's what you're turning from when you repent. Satan's ways, the world's ways, your own ways, disobedience. But let's continue. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. Folks, I've got to tell you, I've sinned more than everyone else in here. I've been bad about it, and I'm not making light of it. Sin is a serious thing. It separates you from God, and then it also is not what's best for you. You ever, for those of you that are Christians, you ever hear somebody say, man, being a Christian is all about don't do this, don't do that. Yeah, because you haven't figured it out on your own yet. And if you'll just live the way God has told us to live, your life will be easier. But maybe that's just too practical, really, to come from the podium. We're supposed to be smarter than that as preachers, to just say it that bluntly. But God, so here's the turn in it. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he has for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our sin. So then Paul says it's all about God and his doing, and he says, you are saved by grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. You are getting something you don't deserve when you are saved. He also raised us up by him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. What a hope. What a hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now this is a different verse than what I used in Romans earlier. But he is going to display his immeasurable riches to the whole world by saving those that he saves. For you are saved by grace through faith, and that is not from yourselves. You didn't do it. It is a gift from God, not from work so that no can boast. But now here's where it turns again. You were a child of Satan. That's a rough way of saying it, and a lot of you don't like it, especially when you're thinking about your children. But God came in and made you a child of his. And it was all because of, and salvation is all about God's grace. And it's all about having faith in Jesus Christ. And we know that because of the scriptures. But just like Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 just said, all of that is for God's glory, not your own. 
He's making himself look good by saving a wretch like you and me. That's some good news. But now to finish this up, we need to see the full picture of these verses. For we, everyone who is saved, Christ is working, we are his workmanship. Christ is doing this work in us. The Holy Spirit is living in us. We are created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. I thought we were created so that we could say a prayer and then live however we want to live the rest of our life and then go to heaven instead of hell. Absolutely not. You were saved. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, to do good things, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. 2 Timothy 3.17 says, We are equipped for every good work. Ladies and gentlemen, this concept or this idea that we are going to have salvation and then just waller around or just go and draw a paycheck every day or just maybe um, just always wonder, am I doing enough for God? Well, I probably should do this or I probably should do that. That is nonsense. That is absolutely not biblical. And we have to get to work. We must get on the road together serving God by serving people. So there's some... Some lists that I can give you. Romans, we're not going to read these. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 and 11. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Those aren't exhaustive, but those are all lists of spiritual gifts that God has given people. He doesn't give anybody all of them necessarily, but you don't, it's not like you can only have one of them in order for you to serve him. Paul just, we just read where he created us for good works. Some of these are administration, apostleship, craftsmanship, discernment, evangelism, just telling people about Jesus, exhortation, building folks up, faith, giving, healing, helps, hospitality, intercession, not only Christ intercession, but you go in and you intercede for people when they're in a bad spot in a relationship, knowledge, leadership, mercy, miracles, missionary, being a missionary, music, sister, you can sing, I think I know one of the gifts that God gave you, pastor, Maybe, maybe you, you go somewhere and do what I'm doing, and you, you're the elder or the bishop or the overseer that God puts under Christ as the under-shepherd of one of his local congregations. Prophecy, service, teaching, tongues, interpreting tongues, and wisdom. I want to tell you, when you hear prophecy, don't think of Old Testament foretelling the future about the book of Revelation. When you hear the word prophecy, you need to be thinking about proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. When you look back to Old Testament prophets with prophecy, there is not this sense that they are writing half of this book. It's not really half, it's a little over half. But this book, and they're just telling about what's going to happen in the days of Revelation, that we consider the book of Revelation. That's not what they were doing. They were actually telling the people in that contemporary audience over and over and over again, if you don't change your ways, you're going to go straight to hell. And sure enough, all of those kingdoms, Israel and Judah, ended up being taken into captivity. Just like they proclaimed would happen. Now, especially in the book of Daniel, there is some of that foretelling in the future of what's going to happen. But that is a minute part of what the prophets are doing when we study the Old Testament. Old Testament prophecy actually has much more to do with what we need today, which is some people just like me, just not scared enough and just not smart enough to tell others we've got to get on the road living and working for God. Healing, that spiritual gift. I'm not telling anybody that they couldn't be a healer, but if you are, I want to see it. I think it'd be really cool. It's always immediate in the Bible, so it's not give me, your, give me $100 and then in 30 days you'll be healed. It's absolutely full. Someone doesn't come in with a bad limp and leave with just half a limp. They were fully healed in the New Testament. They never paid for it in the New Testament, and it always pointed people to God. So if you're going to be a healer, heal the way that it's biblical. And again, let me see, because I think it'd be cool. We'll give God... Praises together for what he did through you. Speaking in tongues, I don't want to make a mountain out of a mohill, but if we're going to speak in tongues, it's worth saying that we can get a lot from, from 1 Corinthians on speaking in tongues. Obviously, it happened multiple times in the book of Acts. Now, if you're like me and you grew up in rural western Kentucky, you're not familiar with speaking in tongues very much or very often. 
But it absolutely at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I think it is, says, do not forbid people to speak in tongues. And so I'm not going to get up here and forbid people to speak in tongues. That would be silly, right? And that would be a fraud. But I can tell you that the Scriptures also teach us this. It should be edifying, it, so it should provide moral improvement. It should never be contrary to Scripture. It should never be some new revelation that is put on par with Scripture. It must be translated or interpreted, or there is no sense in it happening. No more than three people can do it in a single service. Only one person can do it at a time. And if you finish up that thought about church order, then Scripture says in 1 Corinthians that only men should be doing it. Nothing crazy, nothing out of mind, nothing distracting, etc. A strong argument could be made for speaking in tongues would be relevant in today's church if someone walked through those doors, they did not speak English, none of us knew his native language, and God provided the gift for someone to speak in that person's native language so that they could understand the good news of Jesus and how to get help in Panama City Beach. 1 Corinthians, you can read 12 and 14 to get all that. But read 13 as well, because that's going to tell you what's the main thing, and the main thing is for us to love each other in chapter 13. But if you read all of chapter 12, but especially verses 12 through 27, you're going to find out that God's going to use everybody, and he uses this illustration. Got a doctor friend in the house today. He can attest to this. You can live without a hand, but you're not going to live and fully function the way that other human beings are able to function if you don't have a hand, or if you don't have a foot. Or if you don't have this or that inside of you. The body was made to function with all the parts working together. God uses every single person that is at the church at the beach, and we call it being on the road together, serving God by serving people, so that this church is exactly what God wants it to be. So how are we going to help you do that as ministers? Well, on the, on the website by tomorrow afternoon, we'll have up a personality profile. We'll have up a spiritual gifts profile. You say, oh, I don't want to do that, Pastor. Here we go again with that stuff. Well, how do you think you know so much about what you should be doing if you ain't doing anything and you're not willing to let me help you figure out what you need to be doing for God's kingdom? I hope I said that right. That was, I kind of got to talking. But let us help you desire in your heart to be a better Christian. So we can help you by those assessments. And then here are three things that you can jot down right now or text yourself if you need to. Ask yourself these things, and this will start to point you towards how God wants you to work. What are your passions? What are you passionate about in life? What are your life experiences, good and bad, all the things up until this point? How have they molded you into who you are today. And then the third question is what is or what are or what were your pains? What hurts you? When you look back on it, what still hurts? My little sister, I can't say she's been some perfect person, but she has the best heart out of four children that my two believing, strong Christian parents have. And she very well could be watching this, but she's in the hospital now. And I tell you, I don't understand why life has turned out hard on her. I don't get it. She's got a great heart. She tries to rear her children the right way. She carries them off to church. She tries to spend less than she makes. She goes to work every day, other than now, she's in the hospital. How come, God, for my little sister, my father served you, I'm serving you, my life is easy, daddy's life was easy, how come Joy's life is hard? I don't know. And it pains me. And you have those same pains, just not with a little sister named Joy. Joy. But you going through those pains and joy going through those pains, God is going to use that for good because we love him and we are called according to his purpose. And so we just have to hope and have faith that things are going to work out for God's glory and therefore for our benefit through all the pains. But it's tough to accept it. It's tough on me, so I can't imagine for her. 
This thought. Your design reveals God's will for you. So why personality, Jay? Why spiritual gifts inventory, Jay? How come think about your passions and your experiences and your pains? I'll tell you why. Because just like the prophet Jeremiah, just like King David, just like the apostle Paul, all of that stuff was things that God knew beforehand were going to go into you so that you can serve him by serving other people. He doesn't need anything you have. He controls it all anyway. So that's why I'm asking you and pleading with you to get on the road with us. I want to tell you just one quick story. I'll be quick, but she's not in here, so I can say this. So we were living just outside of Memphis, Tennessee for a couple of years, and I was a head high school basketball coach at a uh, actually a big high school, one of the top four or five largest high schools in Mississippi, but it was a suburb of Memphis, and my best player, his family, he and his family asked me to go to church with them. And so, like, I, I was pretty vain and, like, not, I mean, I'm still not, but I really wasn't that good of a person back then, and so, like, I was thinking, so, like, my best player and his family are going to like me. I'm going to check the mark to go into church Sunday. Perfect. Kara, we're going to church with AJ and his family Sunday. So we hop in the car and we drive and we get there. So again, I'm going to tell you that I've only had less than 10, more than five, less than 10 experiences with what we would call real charismatic worship, okay? And and by that, I mean um, healing, speaking in tongues, things of that nature, all right? The sign gifts, if you will, uh, prophesying like not foretelling, but foretelling the future. I haven't had a bunch of experience with that. So we get up and we go and we have on our Sunday's best and we get there and Sunday school, when that was over with, I was ready to hit the door. Like that was a lot. She was talking like crazy. I don't know what she was saying. I mean, she did, I guess. And I I don't even remember if there was someone there to interpret or not, but I thought, man, that is church. And they're like, oh no, 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 no. That's not church. That's Sunday school. Church is back here in the back when we all get together and we have church. Whew. Okay. So Good enough. So here Karen and I go to church. I'm going to tell my wife a little bit. So like I've actually, I'm going to brag on myself, I've actually got some rhythm. Like if my wife and I are somewhere tearing the club up, like I can move a little bit. <laughs> all right. Well, my wife, not so much. Like about all she's got is this like little shoulder thing she does. Okay. <laughs> so we're in this church and uh, man, we're, we're, we're fish out of water, you know. We're like, wow, this is really different, you know. <laughs> But, okay, we're good. They're worshiping God. I could see it happening. I mean, by God's grace, I could see it all start to shift. And I thought, oh, no, because they had told us to pull out our ties and put it in the envelope. Now, he was a pretty good player. I looked in my wallet, and I had a $10 bill, and I had my debit card. I almost put my debit card in there, but he wasn't that good, so I just put the $10 bill in. <laughs> but, so I put it in there, and I can tell they've got this box up in the front, like on, you know, at the altar type thing. And I can tell by the way people are starting to shift. I was like, man, everybody's going to have to go up there dancing to put their money in that box. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. So I take one foot and I untie my other shoe. And I say, hey, baby, hold this real quick. And she took it. And then I was down there tying my shoe until she was stuck waving her tithe in the air. And I'm saying that. I'm looking up like, it won't tie. I don't know. I can't tie it. <laughs> And she's stuck having to try to dance all the way down the aisle to put her or our $10 in, into their chest or bucket or whatever. I say that not to make light of that church. People's lives were being changed. I say that because sometimes things happen in the life of Christians we're just not used to, right? We all, we all have our own preferences and stuff. But back to getting on the road. Your design reveals God's will for you. You could even say your design reveals God's destination for you. So develop yourself. Like I say, check the website tomorrow afternoon. Think about this and give realistic answers to what are your passions, what are your experiences, what are your pains? Because God is going to use all of those to mold you into who he wants you to be and to do what he wants you to do. But I would like to tell you this about your good works that we are commanded to do because of what Christ did by saving us. They should all be glorifying to God, we learn in Philippians 1. 
They should, our good works should exist in large numbers, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. They should be fruitful, we learn in Colossians chapter 1. And we should be zealous or enthusiastic, we learn in chapter 2 of Titus, about going out there and doing our good works on behalf of God. So folks, there's only going to be one way that you're going to meet God one day, as it says in John chapter 14, I think. And you're going to go and you're going to meet him. And he's going to look at you and say, job well done. You have done everything I sent you to the earth to do. And that's if you get on the road, you start taking it seriously, and you start that realization that that moment you said that prayer, asking Jesus into your heart, that wasn't the ticket. The ticket is a life of salvation to where you have turned everything about your being to God and His ways. And you are on this road with a group of other people being who He's called you to be, doing what He has called you to do, and it's all for His glory, not your own. If you'll do that, I promise you, you will be happier than you've ever been. You will have more joy than you have ever had. And when you meet Him, He's going to tell you a good job. So again, thank you for joining us uh, for week two of On the Road. And I look forward to next week uh, having week three. And actually, we're going to combine week three and week four of On the Road next Sunday morning. You know, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I urge you to do so. Not because it would make you right with me, but because it will make you right with the creator of the universe. You know, it's pretty simple but yet it is also life changing. And so your eternity, what's gonna to happen to you the rest of this life and then after this life depends on if you trust Jesus Christ and the work he did on the cross for your sin to be forgiven and then you be reconciled because of what Jesus did for you with God the Father. You know, if you've never been saved, you've never put your faith in Jesus, you've never really become a Christian, Call me or email me. Number and email address are at the bottom of the screen. There's nothing I would like better than to be able to talk with you about your relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, here at the Church of the Beach, we want to make sure you know that God loves you, and we do too. See you next week. The Lord bless you.